Hello, my name is Yoshimi Anzai from University of Utah. I am going to talk about thyroid imaging. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak. I have nothing to disclose. Let me start from thyroid anatomy. Thyroid gland is sitting in the top of trachea and is surrounded by the middle layer of deep cervical fascia. Um, middle layer of deep cervical fascia is anterior wall of the retropharyngeal space. So that explains that sometimes the thyroid pathology extending into the retropharyngeal space. Two important structures, recurrent laryngeal nerve and parathyroid gland sitting in a tracheal esophageal groove. And that explains the two major complications from total thyroidectomies are vocal cord paralysis and hypothyroidism. Superior thyroidal artery is the first branch of ex external carotid arteries, and inferior thyroidal artery is the largest branch of thyroid cervical trunk. You may occasionally see a pyramidal lobe extending from thyroid isthmus. Recurrent laryngeal nerve is a branch of vagus nerve and it loops underneath the subclavian artery on the right and the aortic arch on the left. Thyroid gland developed as an endodermal thickening of the pharyngeal wall between first and a second bronchial arches. The proliferation originates from the area called the foramen of cecum, which is the junction of anterior two-third and a posterior one-third of the tongue. From there, they migrate downward through the tongue musculature and extend and uh, wrap around the hyoid bone and it descend deep to the strap muscle into the anterior, uh, anterior to the trachea. When thyroid gland fail to descend, it is called ectopic thyroid, particularly the one sitting in the base of the tongue did not go anywhere, it's called lingual thyroid. Notice there are multiple punctated calcification in particular case, a likely benign adenoma in the lingual thyroid, and then there's no thyroid tissue in the anterior neck. Sometimes uh, half of the thyroid decided to stay in the original location, half of them went down to the neck. The only problem is the one went down to the anterior neck, actually got a Hashimoto thyroiditis. So mm -hmm. notice there is a lack of physiologic iodine and a lack of enhancement. Vast majority, over 90% of the ectopic thyroid is at the foramen of cecum, the base of the tongue, but occasionally you may see infla uh, hyoid ectopic thyroid. It's almost there, but couldn't quite make it, so sitting into the infrahyoid neck. Thyroid cell duct cyst is a very common cystic lesion in the head and neck. This is the suprahyoid thyroid cell duct cyst in between anterior belly of digestive muscle, um, and extends uh, anterior and also posterior to the hyoid bone, which is a classic appearance of thyroid cell duct cyst. Infrahyoid thyroid cell duct cyst that can be off midline or could be multilobulated. And it sometimes extends into the preepiglottic space in between thyroid lamina through thyrohyoid membrane. Notice it's still embedded into the strap muscle, so deep to the strap muscle. The other cases, again, stretching strap muscle and a, a, a compression, sort of get pressure erosion into the thyroid lamina. Occasionally, you may see me nodulality in a thyroid cell duct cyst. That is a big red flag because most likely this is papillary thyroid cancer associated with thyroid cell duct cyst. This is the case. Uh, they found a six millimeter papillary thyroid cancer in a thyroid cell duct cyst in these patients. Let's move on to infection and inflammation. Here is a middle-aged woman came to the emergency room with a fever and anterior neck pain. CT scan shows kind of enlargement of thyroid gland with a fuzzy sort of border uh, on both sides with some edema surrounding. As compared to normal thyroid tissue has a well demarcated border with clean fat. So clearly there's an inflammation going on. This is a case of a subacute granulomatous thyroiditis also known as decurvain thyroiditis, and usually associated with a URI. The pain is likely due to stretching the thyroid capsule because of the inflammation, 
And then during the process, they release the thyroid hormone. So a patient may have a transient hypothyroidism. Other subacute thyroiditis, such as lymphocytic thyroiditis or postpartum thyroiditis, are painless. So they call they are called the silent silent thyroiditis. So pain is a kind of hallmark of a subacute granulomatous thyroiditis. Now thyroid gland is a very clean, sterile organ, not like a sinus or protein tonsil. So they don't get an infection like this case. Like when you see abscess, a collection of fluid and pus, think about likely false bronchial arch fistula. False bronchial arch fistula is originating from um, piriform sinus through the thyroid gland and it opens into the anterior neck. Patient may have a vocal cord paresis which extend into the tracheoesophageal group or extending to the retropharyngeal space and creating retropharyngeal abscess. Uh, it's almost always on the left side and they will wonder why. And it must be something to do with a false bronchial arch gives rise to subclavian artery on the right, but aortic arch on the left. That asymmetry, kind of embryological asymmetry, likely predisposed to left side to be more common. Um, so when you have a bilateral extensive infection in a thyroid gland. Again, thyroid don't usually get a bacterial infection. Most likely patient has immunocompromised status, such as this patient, HIV patient with MASA infection. So oftentimes those are the patient with immunocompromised status. Now let's talk about incidental thyroid nodule. Um, incidental thyroid nodule, as you see, um, very prevalent. An increasing instance is likely due to use of medical imaging. 30 to 50% of ultrasound, 18 to 25% of a CTMR, and 50 to 60% of autopsy found as incidental thyroid nodule, which means half of you guys may have a thyroid nodules. But the malignancy rate is less than 10%. And a vast majority of thyroid cancer, if any, is a small papillary thyroid cancer, which is incredibly uh, indolent and a great prognosis with very little impact on mortality. So the health benefit of diagnosis and treatment remains unclear. <clears throat> this is the active surveillance study done by Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, 291 patients with PTC less than 1.5 centimeter underwent active surveillance. Knowing the patient had the thyroid cancer, they follow using ultrasound and the 3D tumor measurement. Uh, and they found that gross more than three millimeter was found in only 2.5% of all cases in two years and 12.1% in five years. And no regional lymph node metastasis was found during the active surveillance period. Um, independent predictor was younger ages, which means the younger patients nodule, PTC tend to grow a little more than older patients. But the point is active surveillance is a feasible option for small papillary thyroid cancer. So you don't really jump into FNA, you don't need to jump into surgery um, unless there is a symptom or something else. So this is what I do when I found the incidental thyroid nodule. First, take a deep breath and look for three things. What are the three things? I look for, is there any extra thyroidal extension? I look for lymph node metastasis. And if I have an MRI, I look for T2 signal. And if you have a lucky enough, if you're lucky enough to have a diffusion, then you look for ADC. And I search for all the exam to say, I can say that's stable um, and major thyroid nodule and check the patient's age and decide what, whether I should recommend ultrasound or not or vary into the body of report. And this is a wonderful paper by Dr. Jenny Wong in a white paper in the instant of thyroid nodules. I know that many people know they cut off this 35 and one centimeter over 35 will be 1.5 centimeter. But I think at the important point of this graph is when you have a suspicious C2 MR findings, you go straight to evaluate an ultrasound regardless of size or age. 
But at the same time, the patient, if the patient has a limited life expectancy or comorbidity, like end stage renal disease or heart failure, then you really don't need to work out on an instant thyroid nodule. So that's the more critical point of medical history. T2 signal is a rough marker of tumor severity. So bright T2 signal is a good thing, and dark T2 signal is a bad thing. For example, the gray area of nodules with extrathyroidal extension, this is going to be cancer until proven otherwise. So you would want to recommend ultrasound regardless of size or age. This is a patient with 55 years of male, status post cervical fusion, and they're looking pretty good, but you found a thyroid nodule. But a good thing is T2 bright signal, well circumscribed, no extrathyroidal extension, no lymph nodes. Diffusion, we got a diffusion at the time, and there's no restricted diffusion, if anything, facilitated diffusion. So those are benign lesion and likely colloid cyst. Other patient, 37 years old woman with neck pain and radiculopathy, C-spine looks pretty good. So this is easy peasy spine DGN MRI, but at the end of your uh, dictation, you found a little multiple nodal disease with a kind of punctuated T2 bright cystic or T2 hyperintense lesion. That is not normal. So when you look carefully, you, you can see that multiple relatively small, although they're too big for level four lymph nodes. So those are likely papillary thyroid cancer until proven otherwise. It really doesn't matter if thyroid looks normal, you still have to get an ultrasound. So we got an ultrasound. Ultrasound wasn't too exciting in the beginning. However, when you turn on the Doppler, you can see kind of peripheral vascularity around this six millimeter thyroid nodules. And this turned out to be papillary thyroid cancer. Neck lymph node is more exciting. There's a multiple hypo, hyper echogenicity consistent with papillary thyroid cancer metastasis. So you can see those findings on the MRI and recommend ultrasound. This is a patient with trauma, again, CTA head and neck. We have many of those every night. Uh, due to dissection, well, he didn't have a dissection, but what he has was had a hypodense lesion with a peripheral hyperdense foci. So what do you do? Looking for lymph nodes, looking for like ETE. So lymph nodes, yes, they are multiple, multiple cystic um, lymph node in bilateral lower neck. This is very concerning. And when you go further down, you can see extrathyroidal extension to disrupt muscle. So these mm. are thyroid cancer until proven otherwise. Another patient, trauma patient, CTA head and neck. Is this another incidental thyroid nodule? Looks like a hypodense uh, lesion in the anterior part of the thyroid gland on the left. But look carefully, the patient had a dissection flap and a common carotid artery extending to the external carotid artery, and it occluded superior thyroid artery. So this is an infarction of the thyroid gland and a superior thyroid artery. Um, so it can mimic thyroid nodules. This is an even sad story. The 20 years old girl who jumped from the three-story balcony on a Valentine's Day. Sad. Um, don't know what happened. Um, so the patient was profoundly hypovolemic and hypotensive. Uh, gross coma scale was three on arrival and a multiple spine fractures and subdural hematoma. And then the CT scan of the uh, neck shows kind of very diffuse enlargement of the thyroid gland with a perithyroidal edema. Interestingly, there's a, some peripheral, uh, some punctuated calf, uh, enhancement on the right, but there's no enhancement on the left side. So this is called shock thyroid. Uh, and a patient with a profound hypovolemic shock uh, when you have a hypovolemic shock, that the blood flow goes preferentially to important uh, organ like brain or heart at the expense of other things like thyroid gland. So this is the uh, documented findings on a hypovolemic shock complex.
And this is the head CT of the same patient. Again, profound the cerebral edema, diffuse, tight, tight cortical cell sign, a ventricle, pseudo subarachnoidal sign, and maybe there's a brainstem hemorrhage, and then skull based fractures, an extensive massive lumbar spine fracture. And also enhancement of adrenal gland is also documented in a hypovolemic shock complex. 23 years old pregnant woman with a neck mass. Notice there's a multiple cystic nodal disease with punctated area of enhancement and maybe calcification in the lower neck, in the lower neck in a paratracheal region. When you see it, most likely papillary thyroid cancer until proven otherwise. It really doesn't matter that when you see the nodule in a CT scan because a CT scan is not sensitive to detect small thyroid cancer. So you're going to have to recommend ultrasound. Ultrasound find a really 4 millimeter papillary thyroid cancer. Another patient, 57 years old with back pain, notice there is a metastasis to the spinous process of upper thoracic spine. Well, it could be from breast, it could be lung renal cell, but look for the thyroid. There is a mass extending from the right thyroid gland extending to the tracheoesophageal group and it pushing the cervical esophagus to the left side. So this is the thyroid cancer metastasis. She, she didn't know she had a thyroid cancer, just present with a back pain. So there are many, many options for thyroid imaging. The good news is we could have best ultrasound or CT, MRI, or PET scan. I think the earlier sort of encapsulated early stage thyroid cancer, we probably don't need any cross-sectional imaging. All they need is ultrasound. But if you have an extensive disease like a spine metastasis, like the cases that I show, that would be most likely staged in FDG PET. So what we get on the CT or MRI are likely the thyroid cancer with either palpable uh, lymph nodes in the neck or some sort of clinical symptoms such as shortness of breath or hoarseness or a fixed nodule. There's something that are more locally need to get evaluated. So what we have to do is really evaluate extent of disease. Extension to the larynx, esophagus, hypopharynx, Prebrachial muscle is a crowded encased. Are they extending into the retrosternal region that need to be called thoracic surgery? Is there any lymph node metastasis or vocal cord paralysis or distal metastasis that we can see on the bone or lung? So here is a PTC, papillary thyroid cancer, extending into the uh, larynx, larynx uh, through cricothyroid junction. Notice this cricothyroid junction looks pretty normal. This is a widen due to this mass and truncation and destruction of thyroid lamina. And there's a sclerosis of the cricoid and arytenoid carcinogens. The tumor also extends into the retrocricoid hypopharynx. Those are very important things because the surgeon uh, need to do not only total thyroidectomy, but laryngectomy if this patient needs a surgery. Here's another case of papillary thyroid cancer with the tracheal invasion. Notice the deformity of tracheal wall. Normal TE junk group, it shows nice fat. This side, this fat is completely obliterated. We don't have a distinction between lateral wall of the cervical esophagus and a tumor. And this explains the PET finding of abnormal aptic within the right tubercle code because the right tubercle code is doing all the job. Left side is completely paralyzed. So this is a common pitfall that you don't want to call that to be cancer. Now, surveillance images is very, very important, and we play a critical role. This is a patient with a total thyroidectomy and came in as a surveillance imaging. Um, notice this T1 hyperintense retropharyngeal lymph node metastasis, and also additional lymph node metastasis kind of extending to the parapharyngeal space, multiple cystic kind of more fluid to fluid level things in the uh, skull based retropharyngeal lymph node metastasis that are positive in FDG PET. So, retropharyngeal lymph node metastasis is not uncommon for thyroid cancer. So, please, please include the skull base if you evaluate the thyroid cancer follow up. Don't just scan the neck, the lower neck, just because the thyroid is lower 
always, always look for retrophalangeal lymph nodes. Now, there's a minor changes on the differentiated thyroid cancer staging and on the AGCC ACE edition, just to summarize, but everything are downstaged. For example, age cutoff increased from 45 to 55, so younger patient, meaning younger than 55, uh, would be all stage one or two. The stage two be distal metastasis, so the cancer with lung mets or bone mets are still stage two and patient was 54 or younger. And the excellent prognosis of 85 to 90 years disease year survival. Size cutoff also uh, increased from two centimeter to four centimeter for T1 tumor. And most importantly, lateral and central compartment lymph node metastasis, this used to be stage four, but now it's a stage two. Extrathyroidal extension to strap muscle is also called a stage two instead of a stage three. So everything is downstaged. A few words about lymph node metastasis from differentiated thyroid cancer. Those can be a very, very small. So for example, this is FDG PET scan showing the multiple uptake, abnormal uptake in a small lymph node. This is like not even five millimeter lymph nodes or seven millimeter lymph nodes as an uptake in FDG PET scan. So do not use one centimeter size cutoff that you may use for squamous cell calcium of the head and neck. I don't use it for even squamous cell, but if you use it, that doesn't work for thyroid cancer. Now, anaplastic thyroid cancer is a bad one. And it's only 2 to 3% of thyroid cancer, but I come for 40% of deaths from thyroid cancer. Usually older patients, more commonly in a woman, 100% disease-specific mortality. All of anaplastic thyroid cancer is a stage four. Patients usually have a symptom, not like instant I found the anaplastic thyroid cancer, Typically, either shortness of breath or hoarseness or rapidly growing neck mass. Imaging study may show diffuse large mass, infiltrative appearances, or central area of necrosis, or hemorrhage, no iodine uptake, so there's no iodine treatment. And many uh, those anaplastic thyroid cancer has a prior differentiated thyroid cancer, so it's sort of a de-differentiation of low-grade to high-grade cancer. It's really bad a prognosis, but currently a lot of work is going on in the molecular-based diagnosis and treatment. So hopefully we'll have a good treatment in anaplastic thyroid cancer in the future. In other cases, the 79 years old male with history of differentiated thyroid cancer, this looks kind of like a more indolent looking, but the posterior lateral one is really looks nasty ill-defined, infiltrated border with central area of necrosis. A patient had an arm pain. Uh, no wonder the tumor is extending to involve the brachial plexus. So, so this is differentiated anaplastic thyroid cancer. Medullary thyroid cancer is a neural endocrine tumor. So they produce calcitonin, not iodine. And exciting things about medullary thyroid cancer is a dotatate PET scan, which is a somatostatin analog. And it's you don't really need a dotatate for very local, regionally confined medullary thyroid cancer, but the MTC extends involved in all the lungs and bones and distance metastasis. Dotatate PET is positive, then you can actually treat with lutetium, which is alpha emitting agent, just like a iodine things. So that if you is the tumor uptake, dotate somatostatin receptor, you can treat with um, alpha emitting agent. So that's exciting. Also, red oncogene mutation is also noticed. So this should be a, some sort of molecular profiling for medullary thyroid cancer treatment. Thyroid lymphoma is rare. It's only one or two percent of thyroid cancer and a B cell. Keep in mind a patient with a Hashimoto thyroiditis has a high risk of a thyroid lymphoma. So Hashimoto patient just uh, present with rapidly growing mass. That's the lymphoma until proven otherwise. And imaging wise, it's not specific. It's kind of diffuse infiltrative tumor. Lastly, this is the metastasis to the thyroid gland from lung cancer. Now, it's rare, but it could happen. And the two most common primary sites is the lung and renal cell. 
So in summary, the vast majority of thyroid cancer is indolent. Uh, so we don't want to overdiagnose low-risk thyroid cancer. Look for ETE and lymph nodes for instant thyroid nodules and also T2 signal to guide you, uh, recommend a diagnosis. And uh, other things that we need to keep in mind is our job is to really um, evaluate the extent of the tumor if you're looking for CT or MRI. And also keep in mind that ACE addition of AJCC staging downstaged practically all the cancer because of the excellent prognosis. But there are bad apple, like a de-differentiation, de-differentiation of uh, well differentiated thyroid cancer to anaplastic that we need to keep in mind. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd like to thank for SHNL for invitation to speak. Thank you. Hi, my name is Doug Phillips. I'm from Weill Cornell Medical College, New York Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this AHHNR webinar on thyroid and parathyroid imaging. And my topic for today is imaging of the parathyroid gland. I have no pertinent disclosures, but I do have people to thank. Uh, and there are other acknowledgments on some of my slides. So the view from 30,000 feet, if you will, uh, in imaging parathyroid disease, there's essentially a single indication for parathyroid imaging, and that's hyperparathyroidism and usually primary hyperparathyroidism. We're going to look at the incidence of disease in these patients, but by and large, we know the patient has a parathyroid adenoma, and we just have to find it. There are a number of imaging options, however. There's no gold standard, and there is tremendous institutional variation. Brief word about the parathyroid gland. There are two superior and two inferior glands in uh, standard equipment human being. Uh, the next two lines are important though, and that does scare people that people may have more than four glands and people may have less than four glands. The normal parathyroid glands are quite small, uh, shaped like little discs, little frisbees if you will. Image on your right, I would just like to call your attention to the close proximity of the inferior glands, typically with the recurrent laryngeal nerves. A little embryology, the superior glands derive from the fourth branchial pouch and the inferior glands derive from the third branchial pouch. So the descent of the third branchial pouch with the thymus, uh, the thymopharyngeal duct if you will, leads to the idea that most inferior glands uh, have a higher incidence of being ectopic and they can occur in many places in the anterior mediastinum, importantly anywhere along the carotid sheath but even in some uh, somewhat odd places. I'm not an internal medicine physician, but we will show you this single chart of parathyroid physiology. It mediates serum calcium via parathormone. Uh, the parathyroid gland acts when it sees low levels of blood calcium to increase the level of parathormone and thereby perform a lot of physiologic functions to elevate serum calcium. It's a negative feedback loop, kind of the classic human being uh, feedback system. The diseases here, the most common by far and away, primary hyperparathyroidism. These patients have elevated serum calcium with elevated parathormone. Uh, that feedback loop is disturbed. It is more common in females and typically patients in their fifth through seventh decades of life. Vague symptomatology, but it's not a benign disease. Secondary hyperparathyroidism seen commonly in patients with end-stage renal disease. Rare tertiary hyperparathyroidism, patients who have a lesion that autonomously produces parathormone. The medical complications, again, are widespread, but it's not a benign disease. And the image on your right, a patient with a palate lesion that turned out to be a brown tumor in association with hyperparathyroidism. You can also notice their spine uh, disease. But brown tumors aren't the only lesion here. These patients have muscle atrophy, cardiac disease, they can have renal calculi and renal failure, and overall an increased incidence of cancer. It's gone from a disease that's largely ignored to a disease that's now aggressively treated. The etiology of primary hyperparathyroidism, prior literature was about 90% of those patients harbored a single glandular uh, malfunction, if you will, a single adenoma. About 10% of patients previously had hyperplasia, 
with multiple glandular disease. That is seen with an increase in incidence in multiple endocrine neoplasia. Parathyroid carcinoma, I'm not going to be talking about it. Most patients tend to have markedly elevated parathormone levels, uh, but it's a very rare entity. The ratio of single to multi-gland disease does seem to be changing, however, and there is a lot of literature that we seem to be seeing more hyperplasia than we have in the past, and there's a vast host of reasons why that might be. That's important for us as imagers, however, and the idea of do we find one gland that's diseased or is there multi-glandular disease is an important consideration. We're going to talk more about that when we talk about reviewing the imaging, but there's actually a scoring system you see referenced here that's been described to determine the likelihood of multiglanular disease. I think that's a useful system, but I view the whole thing as a bit of a common sense approach. You have a patient with a markedly elevated parathormone and very high calcium and you found a single lesion. Is that likely to be the etiology of their hyperparathyroidism or are there more glands involved? I love medical history, and this is an important one, actually. The history of parathyroid imaging leads to what we do currently, our uh, most favored current techniques. Early on, patients were referred to the NIH. It was thought to be somewhat of an orphan disease. Uh, patients underwent a lot of imaging studies, but angiography and venography were quite important. Overall, however, most of the patients were treated without imaging at all and underwent neck exploration to look at all four of glands. Selective arteriography was early on performed to evaluate parathyroid adenomas. Parathyroid adenomas were hypervascular with a prolonged stain and a circumscribing vessel, a polar artery if you will, that correlated strongly with the presence of a parathyroid adenoma. The angiogram on your right, you want to think about it, it's essentially this is our early 4D CT study. Historically, Dr. Dotman and his group at the NIH wrote extensively about parathyroid disease. This is an important article. They said that essentially overall there was no evidence that any preoperative localizing study shortened the operating time. If you're going to just fillet open the neck, whether or not you knew where a lesion might be didn't really change how you did things. In fact, Dotman said, the only localization that needs to be performed prior to parathyroid surgery is to find a good parathyroid surgeon. Times change. We are now in the era of minimally invasive parathyroid surgery, or MIPS. These patients undergo minimal dissection, not much discomfort, get discharged the same day, but now, obviously, localization is key. Intraoperative parathormone monitoring is used to monitor the success of the surgery. When the lesion is excised, if there is greater than 50% drop of parathormone, surgeons consider that a successful surgical approach. So, what are our current imaging choices? Nuclear medicine still remains very important in this uh, evaluation. And Sestamibi with Technetium 99M is the agent of choice. It has a high affinity for the parathyroid gland. It persists longer in parathyroid tissue than other glandular tissue, notably the thyroid. You can do both planar and SPECT imaging, and if you uh, want to get fancy, you can fuse SPECT as well as CT. Sestamibi has this high affinity, so it is taken up by parathyroid adenomas. About 70 to 80 percent demonstrate significant uptake, and they show persistent activity on delayed images. So typically exams at 30 minutes and about four hours. Obviously the sensitivity increases when you have SPECT and you can improve anatomic localization by doing CT fusion. Typical planar images in a patient with a single gland disease 30 minute, a lot of activity, a lot of places, but at four hours, this persistent activity in a right inferior pole lesion surgically confirmed to be a parathyroid adenoma. That SPECT CT fusion can be quite useful. And if you do that, it's a nice way of kind of putting it all together. Uh, here we have a, another lesion. This is also a right inferior pole lesion, which is nicely anatomically correlated with the CT examination for confirmation. Ultrasound has been used for a long time, including early on at the NIH. And as we always hear with ultrasound, and as is true, it's operator dependent. Parathyroid adenomas in expected locations are easily seen by ultrasound, but screening the entire neck and notably looking for ectopic lesions can be suspect. The lesions are hypoechoic. 
You turn on the Doppler, you see that circumscribing or polar arterial structure. And that's way different than the vascularity of lymph nodes. And that's an important anatomic distinction for us. But they just look different. The literature also suggests that if you have time, you can follow arterial structures in the neck to their endpoint to find parathyroid adenomas. This patient with single glandular disease and primary hyperparathyroidism, a hypoechoic lesion just behind the thyroid, turn on the Doppler, there's our polar artery, high positive predictive value for a single parathyroid adenoma. MR has also been used. It was even used early at the NIH. This sounds like any other lesion you've probably heard about on MR. They're dark on T1 and bright on T2 or STIR, and they enhance uniformly. Uh, that can be difficult to distinguish from nodal disease in the neck as well, and that's an important distinction uh, that we need to contemplate. Here's a classic parathyroid adenoma seen on an MR examination. Again, dark on T1, enhances relatively uniformly. It's a small lesion. It's very bright on the STIR exam. CT was used early, but fell out of favor. Seven, eight, nine, ten millimeter thick slices. It's hard to see these small lesions. And it was also difficult to distinguish adenomas from lymph nodes. Our current error with multi-detector CT and more importantly 4D CT has significantly impacted imaging of parathyroid disease. It demonstrated its utility early on with problem cases and is now used in many sites as a primary imaging modality. What is 4D CT? You know, it's not taking four sets of images, but it is multiple phases of tissue perfusion and time being, of course, your fourth dimension here. Most sites perform a limited non-contrast exam and at least two post-contrast studies to assess tissue perfusion. The classic parathyroid adenoma, as we saw from the angiographic data from the NIH, they're hypervascular. So they start out low density, they opacify dramatically early on, and they quickly wash out. Lymph nodes, on the other hand, have progressive opacification over time. So classically, a parathyroid adenoma here on a 4D CT, low <clears throat> in density compared to thyroid tissue on the non-contrast exam, enhances uniformly and intensely, and demonstrates very nice washout on the delayed images. People have evaluated this, and there are a number of papers that have looked at this, and a classic paper here from radiology looked at what they described as three types of enhancement patterns in parathyroid adenomas. Please note the classic appearance, the type A with low density and then gets very high uh, density relation to the thyroid on the early phase only represents about 20% of lesions. And in fact, the type B lesions are the vast majority, 60%. They start low, they remain low to thyroid on the early phase and get low or stay low on the CT uh, venography or delayed phase images. Type C lesions could be problematic because the enhancement pattern is essentially what we have noted to be true in lymph nodes. Obviously, location plays an important part in our diagnosis. This is a single case loaned to me by uh, Dr. Shatskis that, it, to me, just distills why I like 4D CT. This patient with primary hyperparathyroidism, if we did, as some authors have suggested, did only uh, an early arterial phase exam, I think most of us would look at this and wonder if this patient had uh, two parathyroid adenomas, both very small lesions, posterior and medial, kind of sitting back adjacent to the esophagus near the tracheoesophageal groove. But looking at additional images, in this case, let's just start by looking at a washout image, shows very clearly that the image on the patient's right washes out. The lesion on the left maintains the same density as thyroid tissue and would be very likely to be thyroid tissue. But if you throw in the non-contrast examination, this becomes very easy. That little nodule on the patient's left clearly is just a little nodular bit of thyroid tissue, and the lesion on the right is our parathyroid adenoma, surgically confirmed. 4-DMR is now on the scene, and you know it had to happen. Uh, the complex matter, I think, in 4-DMR was finding a technique that worked for you. It had to provide optimal temporal resolution, high contrast to noise for parathyroid tissue, and the spatial resolution that we demand. It became essentially a battle of the techniques, and there are a number of techniques that have been published, but uh, I'll show you, I think, one of the things is one of the more promising techniques in 4D MR.
These images loaned to me by uh, Dr. Cambies Nael. This is a really beautiful examination, 4D MR study demonstrating uh, adenoma and the comparison to a lymph node. So here on the T2 exam, it's a little bit bright compared to uh, kind of background fat suppressed uh, tissue. It enhances early and it washes out late, small parathyroid adenoma. And just for comparison's sake, a lymph node is bright on T2, but stays pretty dark. Uh, maybe some progressive opacification there, but it's pretty uh, minimal degree of enhancement. The beauty of 4D MR is also you can obtain many more phases. So if you want to look uh, to see that little transient increase in uh, opacification, it's much easier to do because you have more phases to choose from. My approach to parathyroid CT imaging, I start by looking where I know uh, typical parathyroid adenoma should be. I look at the arterial images because I'm looking for that increased uh, enhancement, maybe find that polar artery, see if they wash out. And then I start counting glands, and I think that's very critical to our evaluation here. Then, after I'm done, I start looking in the ectopic locations. Remember, patients may have more than four glands. I look in the classic areas. I compare my CT findings with other modalities and with the history. And in reporting the location, I have gone to relating everything to the relationship of the lesion to the cricoid cartilage and AP in relationship to its uh, relation to the tracheoesophageal groove. Some problematic issues in parathyroid imaging. Let's start with ectopic parathyroid tissue. This case loaned to me by Dr. David Panish, just another ectopic parathyroid adenoma. And on the initial examination, as we look through on our 4D CT, there's an enhancing lesion that looks to be within the piriform sinus. It's down at the apex of the piriform sinus, and it demonstrates a uh, typical washout on the delayed examination. On the reformatted images, you can appreciate, again, this lesion sitting down at the apex of the piriform sinus, shown here on the sagittal exam as well. This was utilized by the surgeon's information to perform an endoscopic procedure, and here the lesion mobilized from the apex of the piriform sinus. The next problem issue to address, patients who have existing thyroid disease. This patient had a multinodular thyroid, but hyperparathyroidism, and I think we can all appreciate the lesion in the right tracheoesophageal groove. Fairly large lesion that behaves appropriately. It's hypodense, enhances uniformly, but not much washout. But note in the left thyroid gland, there's another intrathyroid lesion, and intrathyroid adenomas do occur. My interpretation of this examination was that likely there was a single large PTA, but uh, if the parathormone levels did not fall on resection of that lesion, the left hemithyroid lesion was uh, not unlikely to represent a parathyroid adenoma. This was surgically confirmed as a single large parathyroid adenoma, and the existing thyroid nodules were left uh, alone. The next problematic issue, multiglandular disease. Parathyroid hyperplasia, again, may be increasing in incidence, and we need to contemplate that by continuing to evaluate for multiple gland abnormalities. So this patient undergoing a 4D CT, we can appreciate four enlarged glands, a parathyroid hyperplasia, a relatively classic case. We can also have combinations of these abnormalities. Patients who have less than four or more than four glands and may have ectopic tissue existing thyroid disease. This is a nice reflection of that problem that we may face. This is a patient who was 59, had secondary hyperparathyroidism, and had previously undergone a neck dissection where three and a half glands were resected. Parathormone levels remained elevated, and she had significant uh, bone disease, needed a hip replacement, but the surgeons wouldn't perform that until her parathormone was under control. So her first imaging study was after three and a half gland dissection. And here on the Sestamibi examination, there's increased activity in the mediastinum. And on a subsequent CT examination, a large lesion, which was surgically proven as an ectopic supernumerary mediastinal parathyroid adenoma. Parathyromatosis is an unusual condition, and just a brief mention of it as a disease. 
Parathyromatosis was initially described in patients who had parathyroid carcinoma who essentially seeded the thyroid bed. It's also been subsequently described in patients who have undergone resections of benign adenomas. So this patient following resection of parathyroid uh, tissue and hyperparathyroidism had elevated parathormone levels and on a subsequent follow-up 4 DCT examination, multiple nodular foci of enhancement within the left hemithyroidectomy bed. A cestamoeb examination demonstrates increased uptake in this region. And this was surgically explored and multiple nodules of parathyroid tissue were excised. This is parathyromatosis. Surgical management options have changed again. Uh, and one acknowledged current approach is four gland expiration for every patient via a single small midline incision. The problematic issue here obviously is running into some vascular anomaly that you're not expecting or not finding parathyroid tissue in the standard location. The success rate's very high, but ectopic tissue is certainly a problematic issue here. Imaging in multiple gland MIPS, as it's been described, you know, the choosing and examination should provide the best anatomic information, functional information to let us know it is parathyroid tissue to essentially distinguish parathyroid tissue from anything else. Also, that screening for anatomic variants that can be problematic to our surgeons should be performed via that technique. We could argue that. I think 4D CT and I think now developing 4D MR techniques are probably our best bet to make that distinction. So in conclusion, parathyroid imaging is certainly a different game than most of diagnostic radiology. We're not given a patient and asked to image them to see if they have a disease. They have the disease and we just need to find the offending lesion. Nuclear medicine, ultrasound, CT and MR all essentially have roles to play and institutional strengths are a very important part of this whole equation. What do you do well at your institution? What do you have the setup to perform confidently and uh, on a repetitive basis? This whole idea now of four gland exploration may certainly alter the landscape of parathyroid imaging. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope you learned something. Uh, hope to see you at a meeting sometime soon. Thank you.